I'll just uh, I'll just introduce my topic as people are settling in. Um, so I used. Um, Thanks. Um, so my name is Christine Lee, and I'm a graduate of OCAD um, from the Sculpture Installation Program. So I'm back now to take So Young's class. Um, so my topic today is on Manuel Ocampo, who is a, a Filipino painter. And the question that was posed is, how do East Asian artists deal with the legacy of colonialism? So I'm looking at his work through the lens of trauma, multi-directional memory, and how he redeems himself through that. So Manuel Campo, he's 54 years old now. He was born in the Philippines and grew up um, with parents that were um, both very well respected in their community. I believe they were journalists and, and um, involved in politics. Um, so he grew up upper middle class um, and the Philippines, as you all know, is a, a colony of the, um, the Catholic Spanish and was also at one point occupied by the Americans. Um, so in his youth, Ocampo was made to copy religious paintings by the priests at his school. And I'll get back to that a little bit later on in the talk. Um, in his 20s, he moved to California and continued his studies in art. Um, and he's, he's a very well-respected artists not only in the states but also in the Philippines. So he's most well, Mel, sorry, he's most well known to us as a contemporary painter and he came into prominence during the 1990s LA art scene and is probably most recognized for his use of religious and cultural signs and symbols as a vehicle for socio-political satire commenting on colonial subjugation at a time when um, multiculturalism and otherness was um, at the forefront of, of uh, contemporary thought. But one can also view Ocampo's body of work as being the process of identity moving out of trauma, out of the post-colonial, and into fragmentation which he discovers and grows and finally into the stages of reconciliation and reconceptualization. So drawing on the works of trauma study theorist Michael Rothberg and his theory of multidirectional memory, as well as Marianne Hirsch's idea of post-memory, um, I read Ocampo's work through how he either intuitively or purposely um, used his own trauma as an effective vehicle to address these issues of the individual as well as the collective. So these are some of his um, seminal works um, painted in the early 90s. And Ocampo, I think, not only paints and shows his paintings in, in galleries, but also there's a real performative side to his work. And at these openings, he's there, sometimes dressed as a security guard. Um, he puts his canvases on the floor and has viewers walking across them, which all plays into, um, I think, what he wants to do and what he's trying to say that to the viewer. Um, most recently, he's collaborated with a lot of other artists and uh, he's had a tattooist in one of his openings to tattoo his images on the viewer's body should they, should they want that. So I think by indirectly addressing these traumas, um, I mean, this, this piece was shown in uh, Germany in the 90s and was very quickly censored, obviously, because of the swastika, swastikas so it's kind of like a little trauma for the viewer as well, right? Like, you're not going to walk away from this painting with um, kind of no feeling, right? You're going to feel strongly about it one way or the other. So trauma study started in the 80s, um, and it emerged as an attempt to develop an ethical reaction to the representation of human suffering. So this is a quote that's um, much used, and um, Kathy Carruth, 
um, says that trauma itself may provide the very link between cultures. So this is really optimistic and um, its in intentions were good, but there have been criticisms that this area of study itself was subject to Eurocentric um, paradigms because at first it drew heavily from the experience of the Holocaust. Um, but since then, we've expanded to promote more inclusion of other global traumas, which include multi-generational effects of post-colonialism. So building on um, the idea of trauma theory is Steph Krabs and Michael Rothberg, who developed the um, idea of multi-directional memory. So, it's a comparative and ethical study of traumatic histories across different times and cultures, and the goal is to understand the past and collaborate rather than compete in the public sphere. So this creates alliances between marginalized people and creates a more empathetic society. Um, so Rothberg and Krabs offer the framework and it focuses on sites of transcultural memories of trauma. So these include war, genocide, slavery, colonialism, as well as occupation um, of a country. And it's, their focus is not to compete with each other. Um, many times, like even when we speak just with friends or, or things and we say, oh, well, my experience isn't as bad as yours. Trauma is trauma and it's all relative. And I think that's what they're trying to say is that um, you know, we can empathize with each other and we can understand and inform each other's suffering. So these are all big ideas and big goals and I think we've already touched on this with Jessica's um, talk, is that ultimately it's about empathy. And empathy comes not only from insight but from experience. So I think Ocampo very cleverly does this in his work. And uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. So I love this minimalist uh, definition of memory. Memory is the past made present. And Rothberg goes on to say that making the past present is not only an ongoing process, but it's a form of work or action. And as such, multi-directional memory can be seen as a series of interventions that is at the same time individual, embodied, and lived, as well as collective, social, and constructive. So this is a quote from uh, the reading that um, Dr. Park gave us that all made us a cry a little bit because I, I think I read it three or four times before I understood it. It's um, Patrick Flores's um, um, reading on uh, Manuel Ocampo. So Flores here unpacks not only the significance and cultural context of all these religious images that Ocampo uses in his paintings, he's also talking about a postmodern framework um, that Ocampo subverts using his signs, sorry, using these um, cultural signs for his own personal iconography. So he's addressing the personal as well as the collective. And in doing so, he at once invents himself as he's being invented, creating a new dialogue that straddles the space between past and future, Filipino and American, and his identity and his identification with these, these things. So I won't talk too much about um, this piece, but um, again, it's painted in the 90s. And Ocampo really uses um, this idea of being the other um, at a time when multiculturalism was really, um, you know, fashionable. So he puts himself in that privileged position as the other and exploits it. So at the same time he plays into it, he presents these really highly charged symbols of specific cultural trauma and questions their value and importance. And it challenges the viewer's attachment to these national and cultural identities. So this style is um, the same religious um, style that he was made to copy with these religious antiques. And it's very seductive, right? Um, but not only that, it's significant to his own personal trauma um, as seen from the perspective of as a post post-colonial subject. So he even says himself in this article that 
When I was brought up, we were told how to feel, to look at a saint and feel his pain. It's very Catholic, and yes, it's important in the way that it's shaped me. So this painting that Ocampo has used, um, swastikas, um, Jesus, as well as these death heads and demons running around. On the surface, it's pretty easy to, to get a visceral reaction. But if we look a little bit closer, the eagle is something that not only the Americans, but the Germans identify with and have used to symbolize their country. Um, the swastikas are an appropriation of a Buddhist symbol and also kind of a variation of the, the Christian cross as well. So once you start breaking down and questioning what do these symbols actually mean? Where are they borrowed from? They start to lose that initial impact. And I think that's what Ocampo is trying to do is to take the value away from them and to take our expectation of what they mean away as well. And just very quickly, I'm just gonna draw your attention to the main figure wearing the red pointy hat. Um, so originally this is um, known as a capriote and it was originally worn by religious brotherhood in Spain and they flogged themselves in penance. And later on the Spanish Inquisition appropriated this same hat and used it as a symbol of public humiliation. So people that were arrested by the Inquisition they were made to wear this in public. And the significance of the red capriote uh, for the inquisitors was that it showed that the punishment would be death. But in our North American culture, I think the most prominent um, association that we have is of the Ku Klux Klan. And so by Choosing a sign that's already layered with meaning, Ocampo takes those fragments from our collective past and our collective trauma and layers them against all of these political and cultural values. And that takes away the uniqueness of suffering. And when it takes away the uniqueness of suffering, that's where we get that multi-directional memory. So much of Ocampo's earlier work uses this strategy on a, on a collective level, but then he starts moving away from that. And as soon as he's kind of you know, um, embraced by the art community, he totally changes his style. Um, most recently, this is um, a piece that he's done in 2015. He took those seminal images that er, you know, everybody knows him by and he took a silk screen of the, the negatives. So it looks like a photographic negative, but also you know, in those um, optical illusion books, when you look at that negative image and then you look at a blank wall, if you stare at that negative in image for too long, when you stare at that blank wall, that after image is always there with you. So I think he's saying something similar there. So by reevaluating these belief systems that are not only imposed but also self-generated, Ocampo reintegrates an otherwise ambivalent value into his identity in order to move past trauma. And true to this inherited um, idea of forgiveness from his Catholic roots, we can see him redefining this Judeo-Christian reaction to cultural violence as a form of forgiveness. Forgiveness being essential for the liberation of what's held us to the influence of past injuries and grief. So he develops a new style where it moves away from, you know, that kind of romantic, seductive, um, very familiar um, religious iconography, and he develops his own personal iconography. And this self-consciousness can be seen in the evolution of his awareness of his own identity. So that culture vulture, um, you know, he was criticized for taking um, other images that weren't necessarily his own to incorporate into his work. 
that sausage, it's like fat and plump, and what do we think of when we think of sausages? You know, they're very palatable, but they're made out of all the discards and all these unknown things that are just stuffed into a new package. And along with, um, you know, this kind of cartoon aesthetic that he's developed, he also utilizes these really long names. So this is entitled, A Painting for a Proposed Sculpture for a Monument of a Crucified Minimal Minimalist Sculpture. So he, you know, he's using a, a real sense of humor with these new pieces that is, is different than the past that, um, pieces that he's used. So now we see that he's also um, kind of reinvented himself and used the style of um, neo-expressionist and abstract expressionist. And this is a series that he calls the PMS series. So I don't need to explain PMS and all our, our associations with that, but in his definition, he calls it the poor man's schnabel. So again, he's you know, asking us to examine the art world and asking himself to examine his place in the art world as well with this feeling of otherness. So his own anxiety about um, this sense of otherness, um, I think he's also addressing his own ambivalence to um, the membership of, of such an establishment. And I, I really like this quote. It's by, you know, like a, a self-help um, doctor that was known in the 70s. Forgiveness is giving up all hope of a better past. And I think there's some humor in that as well, you know. Um, I think that sometimes, okay. I think at, at some time, um, you know, this, this journey of evolution and awareness of your own identity, not only do you have to reconcile the past, but um, you have to move forward. So, at the end of all this, um, Ocampo moved to, back to the Philippines in uh, 2003, and he started his own practice there where he not only um, paints still but he is more um, involved in curating and developing uh, a place where Filipino artists can develop their own paintings and be shown in a North American venue and so I'm just going to close with a quote from him after so many ways of proving oneself, either by actions or by words, people still perceive you from the outside, which of course is only human. But you do have to become aware of where people are coming from once more in terms of a context and not as an outsider, as I was abroad. Living in the Philippines now, I see my role in, as in reverse, that of acting as an inside man, causing change or rebellion from within. I get to sort of support a struggling artist and encourage their production in the future and hopefully introduce that audience for the artist when nobody is yet looking. Why? Because I've been in that boat and support and encouragement, support and encouragement is the key to an artist's development. There's a hierarchy in the art world that's tough to dismantle and that ma'am sir mentality is app appalling. The tendency of most local artists is that they can't see from a distance which is another term for being critical, assessing the situation, thinking for oneself, and doing what's necessary. Anything else is just theory and not practice. Like, like colonial trauma and like moving past that but um, 
I think Philippine culture because I grew up there like like these kind of bodies of work wasn't present to me and even at this present day I think there's an interesting like how do I coherently say this like kind of holding on to like colonial mentalities where um, Filipinos are naturally darker in complexion but we're promoting through media and other kind of things like fair skin and I think that's like promoting this like aesthetic of fitting to western ideas and um, I think that's like something that's not talked about but not really talked about especially in like South Asian countries like the Philippines just because um, I know like these are kind of two separate like um, places but there are still kind of intersectionalities where like the media and our celebrities kind of promote this oh what kind of Filipino ideas either way they kind of promote this idea of if you were to like let's say be with someone like lighter or even like a white person it's like you're winning like the lottery and like this idea of like being mixed race as a priority like having mixed children in particular it's like just such an interesting thing to talk about where like I don't think we've had that conversation yet or even like not necessarily like, not have it but like acknowledging it to like a certain degree so the big question I, I mean it's like I might have been it was just it's one of the inside in some ways it's a similar you know spirit background um, Philip, you have a Philippine background right yes, so like background so it's I think the color issue hasn't really come up yet very much in your presentation. Do you have a direct response to it, or what do you want to ask further to um, get a clear idea? Of what um, I, I think that it's funny because I actually wrote a paper on um, like whiteness as a as an Asian aesthetic, right? And and we see it we see it here. We see it all over the place. And I think it it. Um, it is very similar to Ocampo trying to adopt all those, you know, symbols that he's supposed to, that he's been raised with, but he doesn't necessarily identify with, right? And the color of your skin, it's, it's in your face every day. Um, but at the same time, I don't think, I think it, it speaks, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think it speaks a little bit to this idea that we should be shameful of um, how we are naturally, that we have to fit into um, this kind of dominant culture. Um, and I think that's what Ocampo was, was fighting against. You know, he, he used that seductive painting technique that he learned, um, but little do we know, like he was forced to, to make these paintings for the, the Catholic priests so that they could sell these counterfeits. And he's part of that process. Um, but then he, you know, as soon as the art world embraces him, he discards that and he says, no, I'm going to start creating my own, my own iconography. And now you're going to accept it. It's almost like camouflage moving into um, you know, being that inside man that he says now. Are you satisfied in certain ways in the middle of, because you asked a really big question also, yeah. is that slightly diverse, which I totally get what you, um, uh, what I raised a uh, question on, but the, in fact, the two discourses, discussions, slightly different one, right? This is more of relig religious, spiritual, um, of um, legacy of colonialism and how it influenced his visual culture as well as it, there's a strong expression of trauma and also challenge to the, those the icons that in fact he talks about um, how the uh, Christianity has been repressed for Filipinos as so much been colonized by um, West who brought the sacred discourses on one surface love for everyone but he was colonialized like the ideology to justify also the colonialism in some ways. And they made that also Filipinos as a secondary more seen than for as white subject as well. So those are the kind of some area, but I think in terms of the whiteness and issues, we has has been touched upon different presentations. We 
gonna maybe come back to it later if there is a chance. I think, I don't know whether there is a chance, <laughs> but I think it's not a, oh, that, no, not your, what's your phone belly? Right, yeah. That's um, just to, to respond to quickly because I don't want this conversation to get completely displaced and lost. Uh, but in fact, it is that, uh, of course, it's all part and parcel of colonial legacy, right? The beauty discourses, beauty hierarchy is all product of 19th century uh, discourses. Uh, hierarchy of race, hierarchy of even skin color or even body shapes, it's all product of those who want to dominate the world, which we continue to deal with it. So, um, you know, the whitewashing uh, ideologies or assimilation, the inability to assimilate, it's, again, it's, it's basically in fact, uh, so this with white normativity, the term I use, that we are currently still influenced, strongly influenced by, and so I think we are expressing or discussing the, our um, reaction to it. And some, of, some people feel anxious and has anxiety while there's a lot of different dimensions in relation to East Asians also, because they are from northern atmosphere rather than tropical atmosphere. There's completely different discourses around the color and race issues, which I think we're gonna have a chance to talk about more. Not if not today, in the future. Some people writing paper about that, so I think we're gonna have a whole day discussion on that issue if you like. All right, any other more questions? One more question. I have a question uh, about forgiveness because I underlined that section in your even essay when I read it. I had a, a little bit of struggle with that, in fact. And so, but what I was interested in is uh, it's very unusual that Ocampo, who are immigrant to the Philippines, immigrant to the United States, very unusually return back to the Philippines. And um, I wonder what in there do you think that um, he becomes someone who are very attached to maybe the kind of identity struggle of Filipinos that he wanted to help with, um, maybe because he was, in a way, the represented uh, a Philippine pa pavilion in the uh, Vienna twice or three times. It's very common that we not see that diaspora Filipino, diaspora Korean represent Korean pavilion, or diaspora Chinese represent Chinese pavilion. Mm -hmm. And that cause question of, are they Chinese enough? Are they Korean enough? You know, that kind of debate always there in every country, and same in, in, in Philippines. I wonder whether you have some more research you've done in relation to this, and what happened to Manuel Ocampo, which I didn't know he went back to Philippines. Yeah, so he returned in 2003 to the Philippines, and he opened up that um, his own gallery there to support um, emerging artists. Um, but he still continued to be very active in the American um, art scene. He has a, a representative in uh, New York as well as LA still, and he still does a lot of shows in um, both those places. But I think the, the quote, um, I actually really identify with that quote. Um, Forgiveness is giving up all hope of a better past. And I think when it's difficult for somebody who's experienced trauma to reconcile with the past, it's still a part of you. It still has shaped you. As he said, it, you know, this has shaped me. Painting those paintings has shaped me. And I think that in order for him to move on from that, he has to accept that that is his legacy. But I'm not hoping that that will change. I'm going to make the change. I'm going to go back and I'm going to do those things that I didn't have done for me, right? Like when he ex experienced um, LA in the 20s, you know, he's an accomplished painter, but he's also working at a paint store or a fast food restaurant and being treated as a guy who doesn't speak English well or you know, a, a guy that looks like he, um, you know, he's, he's made these comments before, um, you know. Anyway, we can all, we can all guess. I think we've all heard what, what those slurs are and things like that. Um, so I think that's where the redemption for, for him, what his strategy is, is that I'm proud of my culture and now I have the inside scoop, so I'm going to further that. 
for all the other Any more questions? Behind the color? All right. Thank you very okay, much. OK, thanks. <laughs> so we're going to have a 10 minutes break. Do um, you want a less break or more break? Less. Less? Yeah. Let's have just five minutes break, please. Five minutes break, and we're going to have a mother. Full screen? Oh, Hi, uh, my name is Emma. I'm an undergraduate at OCAD in graphic design. And whoopsies, hello. Uh, okay, hopefully it doesn't move without me. Sorry about that. Uh, so today we're, I'm going to talk about uh, K-pop and K-pop bands and their symbiosis and hopefully it'll be a little bit fun taking a deep dive into the weird craziness that goes on online. Um, and the reason we're talking about this uh, as part of uh, Eastern uh, culture and aesthetic and art is because it's really K-pop and as it uh, spreads um, is changing the way that we interact with our entertainment um, quite, uh, quite fundamentally throughout while we're talking. Um, please try and think of how this uh, relates back to the typical Western mainstream of what we're used to from previous generations. So, K-pop. Um, we've all, I, I, I assume we've heard this term before, Korean uh, um, pop music, but it's not just music. Uh, it's the whole music plus visual aesthetic plus the viral culture it comes, from, comes with and Korean ambassadorship as well. And this exponential rise of K-pop, um, which is, I think, flooding uh, the international market at this point, uh, is due to the subtle differences between idol, idol culture, and what we um, typically think of as celebrity or entertainer, musician. Of course, an idol is a celebrity, but um, the expectations of an idol are different, both in what he gives and what his audience in turn gives to him. Uh, so before we get to that, a short K-pop history, just uh, in case... Uh, Others are not as familiar. I'm going to try and make it short. Usually, we think of the uh, of it in generations of uh, defining moments um, and different phases throughout the creation and spread. Um, I like to think of it in a slightly alternative breakdown, so you can really see chronologically the exponential development, how each generation is getting sequentially shorter as development uh, moves faster. Um, so, during the first gen, we have a situation where the Korean entertainment industry is about a decade behind the West, and there, um, uh, when SM Isuman uh, studies in the West in the in the eighties, he sees this um, all this culture and um, entertainment that when Korea starts opening up and um, be, um, um, needing a, a way to, to express their own identity and culture. Um, this is when the big three step in, and in 95, 96, 97, the three biggest entertainment companies are launched, and, uh, and they, in order to implement catching up, uh, which is a, a, a huge trend across all of the West, is um, they start idol training. So that means uh, not just um, lucking into, into um, good performers, but really strategically training them. Think of Michael Jackson and how from a young age he was indoctrinated in the industry and that's how you really grow as if in a lab um, a performer, an entertainer um, that can deal with the pressures uh, around him. 
Um, so during the first generation, we have, we have it settled. Choreography is a must. Uh, hip hop is introduced as a, as a form of expression. Unfortunately, this formative generation is mostly retired now. These idols are in their 40s. Um, afterwards, though, after, um, uh, after the model kind of takes off, they realize that they need a larger market beyond Korea. So that's when uh, they take influence from the West and from Japan, and they also try to move into the next market, which is at the time was uh, Japan. And we're, we're adding a little bit more um, sex appeal at this, at this point. Uh, and the next generation is what everybody terms as the golden age. This is the, the, what really standardized and set in stone what the uh, K-pop industry looks like, what fans expect of their idols. These, uh, th this generation are the most influential artistically. They're the veterans that launched, um, well, I uh, popularized for, uh, the, the spread and uh, had actual success in moving beyond uh, Korea. This was at the time when YouTube was new, and this new medium um, helped reach new audiences in a way that uh, couldn't be done before. Um, so this was a colorful, creative generation, and this is the start of really having beautiful idols. Um, Third generation is where you have multinational success, and this is the idols that we know now. They're all over social media right now. They're all over the billboard charts. These are really um, uh, established uh, idols at this point. Um, but now you have a, a, a turn away from what you, from what we copy from the West, and we're starting to come into our, or K-pop is starting to come into its own. Um, with uh, changing male aesthetics, and um, it's more edgy. There's um, there's more experimentation, um, and then we have fourth generation, which is the first aesthetically mature um, generation. This is what you typically think of a uh, Eastern fashion, the movies, music, music videos. This is the the dominant of what we have now, basically, that's really out there and um, that's made itself known. So this is multilingual and multinational on a on a global scale, and the 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 flood of content at this point is really 24/7, and we'll get to that. Fifth generation, however, this is something that I'm uh, that I'm proposing. I really see the uh, that this has been going on at least the last two years. Um, this is a confident, high fashion avant-garde, and that is set on um, that is set on global domination. But it's now moving past the West. Actually, this is this is a point where the West is now catching up because K-pop is and the way that that um, that fans interact with this uh, pop culture and their entertainment is is far beyond um, far beyond the West right now. And it, I mean, it's subtle, but anyways, so. Um, Typical fashion, um, this is like really, really the typical so that you get a sense of, in case you've never seen K-pop before, uh, these are like what you visually you can, you can say that they look like. So one, 1 1.5, 2, 3, and 4, and 5. And if you look at 5, yes, absolutely. Where BTS belong to? Which generation? BTS is third. BTS is in the third generation. I'm, I'm showing, uh, and I think... This is BTS and this is BTS, and that is also BTS. But you see the fashion styles have developed. So it's not only the generation that an idol debuts in, but it's what they become known for, and as they, as they move, the, the fashion and culture also changes with them. Like uh, Big Bang is a second generation idol, highly, probably the most artistically influential. But G-Dragon is down here at number five, her being so avant-garde, always. Um, so, and then you can see stuff like NCT down here, right? That, that, I'm pretty sure you've never seen Western um, celebrities dress this way, right? So, um, okay, so what is an idol? Uh, generally, the process goes like this. I'm gonna try to, 
uh, do, uh, to crunch time this. So in middle school or high school, uh, you audition, you get two to five years training, usually seven years is not unheard of. And then bam, if you're lucky, you debut. However, the pain does not stop there because your company owns you, you are tied to a seven year contract and you are working to break even if you are not with the big three. There are lots of predatory uh, companies and uh, they work an idol to the bone. There are so many idols, a majority of them, that never make a dime. All they're doing is working to pay back the uh, money that the company has invested in them to give them vocal lessons, um, language lessons, uh, music history, um, like you name it. And these idols are very, very well trained. This is school and this is not like being thrown to the wolves. They are be they're getting ready to be in front of the spotlight to handle the pressure. And so tra idol training is pretty hard, um, but, and I've heard a lot of fans criticize, oh, it shouldn't be so hard. And my response to that is, it's gonna be harder once you debut. These, these, um, these companies are not going to put you out there unprepared unless you can handle it. They have a lot of money invested in you. It's a whole industry and every, everything is monetized and um, all, all qualitative things are quantified basically in this industry. Um, anyways, so an idol is typically known to be more polite, more conservative. They're dedicated to their fans always on the surface. Um, so there's no dating <laughs> uh, unless you want a really huge a scandal and to be released from your contract. Um, so you, do, you, uh, you will, as an idol, uh, you dorm with your group. It's a whole big happy family because you're never away from them anyway. You have little to no privacy because work never ends. There's always a variety shows and lives and the content so that you're always on camera in some way. Either you're filming behind the scenes shots or uh, like they're or doing fan questions or you're interacting on the fan cafe. F idols literally sit there like chatting with fans. Um, so uh, there is a high expectation of what, how often to always be constantly available to your fans. So you are presenting a perfect image and which means hair and makeup, you get that done daily. You go to the hair shop first thing in the morning uh, and then uh, there's frequent concept change. A concept meaning the whole artistic presentation of um, uh, and aesthetic presentation of, uh, of a new movement or segment or uh, perhaps release, launch, etc. Um, and so they will change hair colors once a week, once a month. I've seen some, a lot of hair changes. If, if your fans or an interviewer asks for egyo, which means to act cute, that is on tap all the time because an idol always is um, basically perfect, right? Um, and the way that you interact with your members, you're always on. Um, yes, they're your friends usually, but you're also always giving the fans a moment. Um, you know, if I'm leaning, if you're leaning in this way and we're making hearts, that's a, an adorable interaction that's going to be played out online. And these are always um, pushed for and engaged in. Um, of course, hope it's not it's not the end. Uh, it's uh, it doesn't always keep going on like that. Everybody has limits. So as as a, a rookie develops into a senior, you you do develop idols get uh, more freedom and control and solo projects as they grow. But at this point, they've been in the industry and are able to handle that, and they know what they're doing as well, right? So it's all about preparing and uh, being able to measure to not have um surprises along the way because that loses money <laughs> uh, so uh k-pop is a machine one generation of idols will grow and mature and if once you are out of the public eye because there is an expiration date on idols um the new teen heartthrobs come in and you you know the idol the 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 fandom moves on and this is taken care of by uh, the way that a fan interacts with the, the idol, the group, the, the company, and all the con content pushed towards them. So from this presentation, what, I would, what, I would, what I'm trying to say is that 
um, and this is probably the crux of it, uh, the most successful idols are ones who can quickly establish a sense of personality and uniqueness and a relationship or connection with all audiences on a mass appeal while being chameleons who can wear and act all concepts changing frequently with no boundaries and who do not like or dislike anything. So please take a moment to think about what that means. You don't, you don't have any preferences of your own. You don't dislike anything because God forbid that could alienate uh, potential audiences or markets or brands that, want to, that you want to work with, that, you, that your company wants to work with. And so, but at the same time, you're still supposed to project an image that people can relate to immediately because the competition is stiff. There's hundreds of idols, and especially in the Western market, we still have prejudice where all agents look the same. And I'm sorry to say that out loud, but the initial reaction for from like it's it's evident in just of BTS breaking into our into the West in these last uh, in this last year. The initial reaction from a large uh, uh, percentage of the population is that they all look the same. They all look like girls. We don't understand. You know, so how can, are you going to build that, uh, that connection where you have no ties to almost anything, basically? Um, so the idol is an illusion, basically. You're being, sold, um, you're being sold a fantasy, a dreamland. Of course, the idols have like, preferences of their own, but they are not, their job is not to... Um, to satisfy themselves, their job is to satisfy fans. And this is where, um, actually let's talk about this next. So the next um, thing, simplified and generalized. Uh, sorry? Time restraint. Oh my god. Way too long, sorry about that. Uh, there's five global markets, just think of it simply. There is Korea, Japan, China, English market, and now actually the, the, the Latin market also. There are several groups pushing into the Latin market heavily. Um, and um, typically more polite and conservative, which means that they are able to come into emerging markets. Perhaps uh, There are a lot of cultures out across the globe that are not as um, overtly sexual. Um, as um, as provocative with uh, in politics and in um, in um, statements of that of that kind. So K-pop actually fills uh, uh, quite nicely into into these uh, more conservative markets, uh, especially because they fulfill all concepts. Um, if you tailor towards Japan, it's going to be a slightly different concept than when you tailor towards um, an English market. But your idol, a good one, will be able to pull off all of them. Um, so, in order to maintain quality, because that is still a priority, it's a high priority in, uh, in K-pop, um, you, need, you need resources. You need to be fed fans and money, basically, um, in order to, to put out these incredible visual videos um, and, and the fashion and everything that comes with it. It's a lot of work um, aesthetically, so that means a resurgence of physical sales. They have found ways to um, uh, to actually sell physical items. The way that the West is, they're still suffering from the 20 year depression when uh, uh, streaming hit us. <laughs> and only now we're being like, oh, we can stream and make money. Uh, and um, and the K-pop doesn't always, it's not just music, right? So it's all the takeover of all your TV and memes and fashion and your, even your offline behavior, not just online. So um, an idol is selling you everything. It's selling you K-pop, Hallyu, himself, collaborations, other brands and products, and he is a renewable and replaceable resource. Um, everything in K-pop is quantified. There are charts, there's real-time charts where you know the cause and effect of absolutely everything in a way that is uh, bundled because it's a smaller entity. Um, your music stations and your streaming sites and everything, you know that when this, this show is going on right now and you're getting a spike in, 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 uh, in streaming right now, you know the exact, like um, these companies know the exact relation between that. So you can imagine when you have a, such a coordinated entity, how much more powerful it is to know and target 
um, an audience and, dem and a demographic specifically and give them exactly what they want. Um, K-pop fans, well, uh, generally they are known to have to give unconditional and blind support. Um, there are differences between Korean and international fans. Um, the Korean fans often want um, uh, are quite critical of the idol. They want them to be perfect. They want an ideal. Don't date because you're mine. Whereas an international fan is more liberal and, and they'll say, oh, it's okay, it doesn't matter what, uh, what they do, as long as they're happy, they should do as they please. Except if you shatter that image, again, it's not a conscious um, response, but you're shattering a dream. Um, so either way, you get different kinds of, uh, of support, meaning uh, support is basically to milita militantly defend the idol and the fandom. Um, and to buy stuff to interact with, because any kind of interaction is, is, a, is a positive interaction. Uh, fandom is a community, and they will organize amongst themselves to, uh, to support their idol even more. Uh, now, multi-fans is a thing that wasn't around in the first, uh, in the first gen. Uh, I, fans used to be much more, this is my idol, and I hate the other fandoms, and lots of fan wars. But nowadays, we have a huge push to be the nicest fandom, the most inclusive. Um, and uh, we, we, we can be fans of, uh, of EXO, and we can be fans of BTS, and there's no more fan wars because we're such nice fans. And we, hold, uh, we, we, don't, uh, we don't mob our, fan, our, our idols either. That's a thing of the past. Remember when uh, the idols of, sorry, the idols, the celebrities of the 80s in the West used to get absolutely crushed in fans? That doesn't happen in K-pop. They like, they'll hold hands and stuff to make sure the idol has room to move. Um, so to the race to be the nicest basically means to be the most docile fandom because when a fandom is policing itself, an idol can, and their company can do as they please and maneuver them much more easily. Um, and so this is a constant conversation between fans and idols. Um, this, it's, it's superficial because there's no real dislikes or likes or anything like that, but uh, it's continued um, through memes and ships and all this cutesiness and every day you're given a snippet of something to talk about which maintains longevity and entertainment and that is what they need. <laughs> um, so uh, back in the day actually um, when we, uh, when I talk about, uh, when I, uh, shipping, this used to, this comes from the idea of wanting to see two, uh, two, uh, celebrities or, uh, characters from a book or movie or whatever, uh, together, whether they're, uh, whether they're, uh, romantically or friendly in the actual, in, in the fandom, in the canon of the fandom or not, that's irrelevant, but, um, it used to be kind of taboo to ship, whereas K-pop has turned this into, into something that they actually play on. They'll, they'll ship their own, uh, their own um, friends, their own friendships. And so it's turned it into much more, into something that used to be a little bit, oh, we don't talk about shipping because that's a, you know, that's like not, that's a little bit insensitive and we don't want to talk about male-male relationships, et cetera. But, uh, we're, but they've put this into the forefront where they're playing with it and they know that fans um, like their little um, interactions. Okay, so constant communication. So the idol lives for fans and fans live for the idol. Um, we live online on YouTube, Twitter, VLive is a platform that was started in 2015 where basically all um, idol groups have um, a challenge. This is the major place where all your official content comes from. Go there first. Um, and uh, obviously there's condensed. Uh, Oh, this is fun. So online we have streaming parties. And this is actually how uh, K-pop has been breaking a lot of the YouTube records recently. Um, in, just a, in just under a day, you'll get 
a, a billion views or something like that. Not a, not a billion, but like a mil, a hundred million in a day. These are unheard of numbers, and the reason is because fans actually organize. We they have we have streaming parties where we say, okay, this is our goal, and. The, um, the company incentivizes this because they give fans prizes. Oh, if you get to, um, once you get to 10 million views, we'll put out a dance practice video. And so you are you, you're starting to see the relationship. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, light sticks. This is a mark of the fandom. Um, whoop. Oh, typical concert. Way more signs and support than you will see in the West, I'm sure. Light sticks, everybody has, oh, I brought a miniature one in, uh, it's, in it's in the back, but um, these are the mark of all K-pop fans. Basically, back in the day, you used to have oceans of them, where they all, all fandoms had one color each. So you had like the blue ocean for, I don't know what group, and then nowadays they're actually um, uh, connected to central control, where you get really just crazy patterns where every single person in the audience has two more sentences. Just two more sentences. Two more sentences. Because we need to visit questions. Idols are able to see their fans in the crowd, basically. Um, tons of merchandise, which you would not expect in the West. Um, Seasons Greetings Packages, which I am a fan of because this ties into um, school supplies and actually selling you useful things that you may need, like calendars and uh, agendas and uh, etc. Um, I, I, uh, albums come in several uh, versions where you have different pictures inside each one and each one is like, so you're buying the same music, but you're incentivized to buy the album multiple times because it's actually a photo book that you're buying. It's not so much the CD. Everybody gets a CD for free online. The music is free. Um, the, you're buying the pictures. Um, this. Yeah, I think we should receive questions because we have only 40 minutes and we have four more speakers. And so we need to, no worries, because I think um, it was okay. encyclopedic and I think we had to focus on the subject, the focus of was a symbiosis. It was a symbiosis between that and I think you uh, have okay. uh, covered so much detail. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, we were in conversation through emails, so we decided to focus on one thing, and she ended up speaking everything that we did. I can tell you everything. Right. Now, question time. The K pop is hugely popular right now, and I have a lot of questions which I'm harmonizing her views because it sounds familiar to me and I get a lot of inside views and on that and I have my uh, yeah, analysis but yeah, question time. And yep. <laughs> Two more questions guys. Yes, <laughs> Anya. Anya. Um, do you think uh, white K-pop fans orientalize K-popness? Like I, I you know. Ooh. Good question. Wow. I have all this conversation, right? Yeah. Well, perspective that both the idol and the fan, the, sorry, the company wants you to see is that politeness. Um, so you're getting, so Western fans are seeing kind of an ideal. And that also ties into kind of like uh, the, uh, a new political correctness and the me too that's going on in that we want to be better and correct wrongs. So they may not be getting the full picture of what's actually going on in Korea, but they see it as something to work towards, and I think they try to emulate that, at least in the West, in the international market. You want Does that answer? Yeah. Anyone want to come back? But she represents any 
one of millions white hip-hop pen if, uh, if that's uh, um, maybe the clarification perhaps uh, needed so much. Because um, do you have any other comments? I have a comment on that question. Yes. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak on like, I guess the gendered dynamics of the fandom. Because I noticed there's a lot of white female fans with the boy band, and then a, like very strong, almost like hatred <laughs> from white males and even Asian males, uh, resentment, like growing up with this, um, you know, this being like, oh, these are what you're like. Um, people coming to them always being like, oh, you're like the K-pop stars, or like white girls who start to fetishize them because they're only, only because they're Asian. So what do you think of the, like the gender dynamic in that case? That's a tough question, I think. Um, that's, that was a lot of questions at a time, <laughs> one at a time. <laughs> Do you mind if I actually, I have a yes. slide to precisely answer the question. In my slide that I also had to condense my actually uh, in the world space a little bit. Um, there's interesting things that K-pop has made popular is some of the alternative masculinity, mm -hmm. which um, mm -hmm. traditionally there has been this white toxic masculinity, which has been a neutralized representative of what men should be like. And that is perceived as being challenged currently mm -hmm. because traditionally those, um, the commentary that I've read just recently about uh, BTS success and B BBC covered them and the commentary was filled with in some section where, oh, these boys look like girls. How dare girls love this type of, you know, mm -hmm. they look like a girl. And, so, and then all these armies, K-pop, uh, BTS fans and comes and attacking them, of course, correcting them, that you think that, um, you know, the only country um, existing in the world is UK, US, and then also do you, you are threatened, apparently, white male, nerd, and poor, you know, all that kind of conversation, fan world was going in. What I was interested in is definitely popularization of this quite genderless is another term I found the critics use, genderless um, um, masculine images, uh, representing new type of masculinity, which because of its constantly expanding its popularities, um, and more and more people who did, who never, none of keep up a BTS fan, for instance, that when I done research, no one said it was love at first, first sight. It echoes, let's say, if it is Caucasian fans, it was just Asian boys who are slightly smaller figure and not like those, let's say, what are the toxic, uh, the celebrities that embody toxic masculinity? What, what are they? Who are they? I just can't uh, recall anyone. Didn't fit into that stereotype. Look at Jimin, the PTS boy who is currently most popular looked after both. I, I want to write a thesis on him. How come such a figure, which completely can be regarded as very feminine, mm -hmm. is currently hard to throw across the globe of any race, race, racial groups? Mm -hmm. So it is an interesting phenomenon, and I think it's a positive phenomenon in a way that it challenges, again, very predominant stereotypes regarding what is femininity and what is masculinity. But so, anyways, that's something that I had it inside. A lot of the Western fans, um, they, they've always kind of, they, they draw from all, from kind of everywhere, but a lot of the heart of them come from the, white, the fans that used to be into subculture and alternative and emo. And all those non-mainstream, so they're already attracted to what's non-mainstream. So that the, the, the non-toxic male actually is something that they've always, that a, a large segment of that population in the West have always looked for. It's, it's buying right into that. I have a question to you. Um, is there, um, so all the things that uh, you talked about how it is K-pop is machine, um, is in fact, to my eyes, as a, someone who has been studying cultural industry for so long, I always identify these discourses that are produced by also Western media, in a way with a slightly um, undermining undertone, in fact, fitting into the term that you provided, techno-orientalism, things, in a way that, in fact, from the contextual uh, uh, point of view, um, industry is always machine. Machine is industry. So any pop industry 
is a music produced through machine. So there is no difference in terms of how the uh, idols celebrity is marketed. Justin Bieber is the exact same stories. It's just quite talented, medium range, um, good looking young boy from Canada picked up by um, American producer and produced and become a heart stroke as well as cash cow uh, for any producer that in the logic of industry, I'm just feeling like I'm looking at how the Korean um, are also very high and advanced in terms of their role game in the industry. In that machine training system make more desirable product than nowadays exactly. than the Western counterpart, which none of them in the West were prepared to accept. Exactly. And I wasn't, none of Koreans knew neither because they just produced things that like the Japanese used to draw manga and anime, and they didn't expect it's gonna have appeal in the rest of the world. Exactly the same thing. So if I ask you, do you think if uh, people are uh, just Western media is constantly emphasizing and your presentation echoed in certain ways that it is all about money making, don't, is there a little bit of unfairness in terms of balance of the statement? That because it any is not all about money. Yeah, any industry, any music industry, even including viewers, manager behind the is, is all a money-making industry, unless it is like for artists who want to I will respond by saying that it takes a lot of money and talent mm -hmm. in order to uh, to be at the, at, the, at the forefront of an industry, in that they are pushing um, aesthetic and music and uh, dance, and that kind of thing takes professionals and talent, uh, and to be able to to cultivate that, to keep that going, and to push further, um, it always takes more and more resources. Michael Jackson said, uh, he told, that was his advice for basically everybody who asked him for advice. He said, learn from the masters and become greater. So know what came before you, and then push even further. Um, and I feel that this is what they're trying to do, is to somehow cram in a, a, a hundred years of music history across the world into idol training. Otherwise, how on earth are you going to have a genius by, by the time they're 20? This doesn't exist, right? The only, um, but I, I feel that that's, that's not their, their, their point. Time is getting really, yes. Wow. Okay. Hania. And um, I have a question about uh, how Korean K-popness appropriates black culture, like it is essentially black culture at this point, and how anti-black like Koreans are, just like with the whole skin leaching thing, and like you know they like really also want to like look white too. So I don't know. I just, do you want to? Do you have any thoughts? On I do. Um, I believe that that is definitely one of the clashes that it comes uh, that it comes up against when moving out of uh, just the Asian market. Um, however, it from my understanding, um, idols kind of revere um, black culture and black music, and because it had it has had such a huge influence on Western uh, culture, hip hop, rap, so much dance comes from uh, the black music um, culture. So I think they revere it and um, and um, they really want to emulate what what you like, you know, what you respect. Um, and that there's a, perhaps a little bit of double thing or perhaps it just doesn't come across when, when it melts with their own um, uh, physical aesthetics that somehow it just meshes somehow. And so it may, it may come across as culturally insensitive to the West, um, but that's definitely not the intention. And um, about the whiteness, because it again comes up, it's interesting, we should have a forum on this issue, all right? I think the picture open completely, because this one, that, that forum would have gonna blow up, because I know how <laughs> colorized this course is uh, in North America is. Um, there's a things that two things that I kind of quickly contribute, and then we should move on because we have uh, presenters, including you yourself, and time is a question. We need to be done computer by six thirty, I think. Yeah. So then we should uh, run the seven, uh, the forum without computer. Yeah. So traditional Koreans are homogenized, and the same Northeast Asians, and so they are 
from northern atmosphere, there is no direct colonization. And um, in terms of the colors, the skin color, they are pale type. And there's only little diversity within that. If you look at a group called the sister, there are four girls. Their color to skin tone represent just a spectrum of the population. They are just similar. And then even for you, you look the same color tone. But because there are fewer, slightly more tan, like the Hyorin, one of the girls, she being teens when she was growing up. But there's no racial discriminatory dimension because it's the same race. It is more like Koreans are very direct about your appearance, about you getting fat nowadays, so young. You're putting all too much weight around your waist. They will tell you immediately. Yeah. Same, because there is no racial tension inbuilt in their own life. Thousand years, they lived by themselves and alone. So the white being white, being pale means there's no such a thing that you get tan, like the Europeans are obsessed with getting more tan looking because it looks like a you know, sign of your privileges you afford, can afford to the tropical places. There's no such a thing because everyone is afraid to get tan because of their beauty discourse keep your skin color intact from sun damages is the biggest slogan that you learn since you are born. So it is not about obsession of being whiter than you are, but maintain what you get and somebody is anyways, is bad for you, which is now I think Western discourse, beauty discourse will catch up through the Korean discourses. So that color tension, which oftentimes misunderstood cross-culturally, exist in completely different way in the Northeast Asia. When I asked about this to Chinese person, I, asked, I was completely confused about why people think the East Asian would bleach their face. Somebody make that allegation in the YouTube clips. BTS bleaching their faces, and it's a rumor, one of those rumors that spread among the haters also. I asked, Louis, really, have you ever heard the Chinese people bleaches their face? No. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It's also part of the um, culture in the southern atmosphere, tropical culture, which was affected by colonialism by the West. So anyways, uh, that's something that we need to think about. It's a lot of things are new, I'm sure, to you. Uh, anyways, any more questions? OK, thanks a lot. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> Thank you.